Hey everybody, thank you for joining. Today we have Anthony Wuichuan. Anthony started selling online as a college student with not more than $5,000 in hand. But today he's built a million dollar e-commerce business that has earned him a reputation of a passionate entrepreneur. Anthony has built his e-commerce business from ground up by manufacturing and importing consumer goods. Along with his business partners, he's crafted a very good educational Amazon FBA course and his YouTube page and also uh, his Facebook group, uh, Trade Craft, has, um, uh, has nurtured a very strong community of Amazon uh, sellers. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, thank you for having me uh, here. So, yeah, just a quick intro about myself, just to add on to that. Um, I've been selling on Amazon for three years now. I recently quit my job about maybe almost two years ago, a year and a half ago. I <laughs> I saw my boss for the first time maybe like two months ago, and she was a little bit jealous. So that was a really <laughs> a funny feeling uh, to have, um, how the table tur have turned turned a little bit um but yeah uh selling on amazon has been really good to me i mainly do private label now but i started out with doing uh retail arbitrage online arbitrage and wholesale uh there's definitely pros and cons to every single business model but i found private label to just be my sweet spot yeah awesome awesome it's it, like i said it's great to have you here anthony and uh, so you were fresh out of college into a new nine to five job when you started, right? At the same time, you started selling on Amazon part time with a real probability of it not working out. Now that you're successful, how important do you think it was to get your feet wet and make calculated risks? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, you know, when I started out, I only saw it as a side thing, to be honest. I didn't think I was going to be doing this full time. I knew it kind of existed though. Okay. Same thing with uh, like the eBay sellers. I knew like it, there's people out there doing it full time. So for me, what happened was I, I started with retail arbitrage, which is when you go like in stores and you like buy stuff and then you like sell it on Amazon. Right. So private label is like manufacturing your own brands, putting your own branding on it and then selling your own stuff. So while I was flipping other people's stuff, I I realized there was some good money in it. The first um, time I ever did it, I was a college student. It was my final year of final semester of college. And I think I made about like $8,000 in profit. And for me, like to do that within like two months was like amazing. I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. Like uh, I've never had not made that much money in, you know, like that short of a time span. Um you know, up into that point. And then I decided, um, and then after, well, right before, was it after? Like right when I started my corporate job, I was like, okay, you know, like I realized right before I started my corporate job, I went on a road trip to California, like the West Coast for like three months. And I realized that, you know, maybe there's more to life than just working. What if I could do this travel thing like all the time, right? And so I decided to go to a Amazon conference. So when I went to an Amazon conference, I realized that there was a lot of people that were way older than me, actually like in their thirties, forties, fifties, and possibly even their sixties that were doing this for a, you know, a full time, uh, like they have been doing it full time and like they've been doing it for like a couple years already. Right. And I was like, if these guys can do it, right. Uh, not to like, <laughs> be mean about like older people right but like if these guys can do it then i can definitely do it because i understand you know like the technology the i don't know just like understanding stats and like just doing all these things maybe i don't have business experience in general but i understand the internet right and that's how like i decided to really get into the space basically um but you know that was the introduction of me getting my feet wet right to tie it back into everything um I got my feet wet by like just testing it out, doing retail arbitrage. And then I got my feet wet even more because I surrounded myself with, you know, the actual community and like really started like uh, consuming stuff around like Amazon. Right. So if you guys are watching this, right, this is like one of the first steps into just like 
understanding like, Hey, is this Amazon thing for me? Like, is this like, and then this is you educating yourself, which is super, super important um, in the beginning when you're trying to get your feet wet. Um, because with all these like little wins, right. Um, you feel more confident in yourself. And once you build that confidence, then you can really go out there and chase it um, possibly full time, you know? So yeah, so that's how I feel about uh, getting your feet wet. I think it's super important. Um, there's different levels to it. I've seen people jump straight in. Um, for me, I just got my feet wet. Um, but I, did, I do wish in the beginning that I found the right people and the right mentors faster. So looking back on my journey now. That's, that's amazing. And I guess you uh, uh, gave a segue to our next question, which would be most of the people start out selling on Amazon only as a part-timers, uh, as you did, right? So do you have any tips or strategies to grow sales and revenue substantially as a part-time seller? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to be more about, I guess, the private label side. So um, as a part-time seller, though, I guess with auto business models like Amazon, you got to realize that, um, like for me when I was in college, time was not, uh, time was like a resource I had a lot of. But once I started working uh, a corporate job, I realized time is not a resource I have a lot of anymore. You know, like I only had maybe like four or five hours of free time after work. And it was, it's up to you to really decide what you want to do with that block of time, right? You sit there, watch TV, or you can sit there and, you know, watch videos on YouTube to educate yourself about, you know, making money online. Uh, and that's what I kind of chose to do. So basically with RA, um, um, you know, to free up your time with that, you're going to have to learn how to like just scan efficiently, right? Or have people prep help prep you, right? So what this all ties down to is outsourcing, right? So in the beginning, it might not make, it, it might feel weird to like want to hire someone, especially if you've never done it before, especially never, uh, yeah, it's, if you've never done it before, like if it, you're doing RA, then you're going to have to hire someone to help you pack the boxes and ship it out to Amazon because anyone can do that, right? Your job should be out there focusing, headhunting for like the, uh, the gold, right? Sourcing for the profitable products. While with private label, right? Um, the nice thing about that is it's time spent up front. And once you get the product rolling, then you have to reorder, reorder, reorder. But when it comes to private label, there's a lot of little steps that can really take up a lot of time, like contacting manufacturers, right? Um, coming up with like the listing copy, the photography, um, customer service. So depending on where you are in your journey, right? Maybe you can, you want to do all of those things yourself in the beginning, but you always want to remember that uh, if you're doing it part-time, you need to work, use your time efficiently. So ideally um, what I tell people is you want to be working in this upper half box, right? Um, there's four squares. So in the top, you know, I guess top left, it's going to, you're going to be working. You want to be in this square, right? It just, you working on the stuff that you love to do and it's stuff that you um, are good at. Okay. And then next to it is going to be the stuff that you're, um, that you love to do, but are just okay at. Okay. So ideally you want to do, be doing the stuff that you want to do. That's fun for you. Okay. And, and then in the bottom half, it's like working on the stuff that um, you're good at, but you don't really enjoy. Okay. So for me, that was kind of like doing like uh, at, uh, any customer service, um, spreadsheet type work, any analytics. I didn't really like doing that. And then the things you definitely should not be doing is the things that you are not good at and don't like. So for me, that was coming out with like the copy for like the, the listing. Um, most creative stuff uh, kind of like just I can do it, but it just stresses me out. It doesn't come to me as easily as, you know, like other people. Um, so understanding, you know, your strengths and your weaknesses is really important into like making sure you make use of your time, right? Because um, remember at the end of the day, like uh, while we're out here trying to make money, uh, time is really the finite resource, right? So that's why I chose the private label business model because I felt like um, the more upfront time I put into it, the more money I was going to get back um, with by... I guess, disconnecting trading time for money. So, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and also in the last three years, you've launched many products under different brands, right? So how many pri private label brands do you have currently? And why do you have uh, so many brands as opposed to just having one? Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so in terms of brands, I don't know how many unique brands I have, but in terms of unique SKUs, I'm at about 55 now, I believe. I'm not yeah. really sure. Um, but essentially, there's a couple of different ways to go about your private label business, right? And I've seen both methods, in my opinion, work successfully. Um, so the two methods that I'm talking about is like one is like really focusing on less products, but focusing on very high, high quality, right? The other method, right? The second method is just like launching a lot of products, right? And trying to just kind of diversify your risk between this entire portfolio that might make uh, where each individual product might not make as much as the original, um, the branded products, right? And this is like a common theme that I've been seeing with a lot of Amazon sellers, a lot of big Amazon sellers too. So each, each way, uh, each method works. So if you're focusing on like the branded component where you know you have like less private label products, one, like the quality and like uh, the whole experience for the customer is generally going to be nicer because you spent so much time on it. Uh, two, your margins could be better just because of the higher price point you're able to demand because of like all the extra premium features you're providing. Um, some cons to it though, right? Um, you're not as diversified. So if your winning product goes down for whatever stupid reason um, that happens, such as a false patent infringement, false uh, copyright claim, or uh, people say you're selling counterfeit products, uh, which is not true. Even if you're doing private label, that's have ha happened to me. So that stuff can happen. Um, and that's like some of the cons to it, right? So the model that I've been doing, right, I was telling you about is more of like just launching a lot of products um, and, you know, like diversifying your risk between all of those. So maybe like uh, on one hand, like one guy has a product that sells like 50000 a month. I'll have 10 products that sell... Uh, like 5,000 a month, right? So like these like lower private label products, like just kind of like float underneath the radar and people don't, um, I guess, give you as much trouble um, for these products, right? Like the, the competition for those products aren't as high or maybe you're just, you're selling the same product, but you're, you just realize at the end of the day, you're happy with only gaining a little bit of that market share, right? Uh, compared to that main product. So you just focus on launching more products. Um, so that's kind of like my mindset behind that whole methodology. The pros to that is like you're diversified. The cons to that is like there's more uh, repeatable work, right? So you have to continue launching, continue taking pictures, continue updating your listing. Um, all of that though, um, you have to do it over and over and over again. However, it is repeatable, right? And it, there is a system that you can build to it, which is what I like. And that's what like we kind of like teach like our students um, and everything. And that's what um, I found to work best for me. And it allows you to get into the private label business with a little bit less risk because we're not shooting for these items that like sell like 100000 a month. You're shooting for items that sell like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 in sales a month. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like how I go about it. That's great. I, and I like the fact that you've put in so much thought into the kind of strategy that you chose and it in fact has worked out really well for you. So that's mm -hmm. great. And um, yeah. coming to our next question, being an influencer, influencer yourself, uh, now a lot of sellers now promote their products using subtle mentions and endorsements by influencers, right? So how important uh, was influencer marketing when you started your Amazon journey? Got it. Um, so in terms of like selling my private label products, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, you know, okay. So influencer marketing, um, I did an experiment with it and you know, it's been good. I've been generating for the experiment that I ran. I can't recall if I can remember it, but I was making an extra like $70 a day in profit after I did it. However, um, while I really like influencer marketing and I have some friends that like really crush it with their like Shopify brands. Uh, like one guy I know, he runs a company called The Perfect Scope. Um, and what they do is they sell like women's like shapewear, right? Um, and he is about to do like 30 million, um, this year, right. In sales. 
Um, however, I don't know, he cracked the code somehow to like really scaling uh, up the influencer side of his business where it's like very viral, viral content and it kind of just shares it, uh, shares itself on its own. For my products, I did influencer marketing and I guess my market isn't as big, right? So I'm like in the toy market, but he was like in a beauty market. Um, so the beauty market is like really, depending on what uh, category your product is in, right? it might be easier for you to do influencer marketing. Yeah. If you're like in tools and home improvement, it's going to be a little harder than the beauty category possibly, right? Especially if you're trying to sell like a simple nail that doesn't have like too much features or like a simple pencil maybe. Um, it's just harder to um, do influencer marketing on certain products. Uh, for me though, um, like I said, I had success with influencer marketing. I used YouTube primarily. However, I realized that uh, when it comes to business, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of ways to make money. However, you got to focus on the ones that are the most efficient and the most, you know, uh, return on your time, right? So while influencer marketing worked for me, um, I didn't find it to be the best use of my time. I'm sure I could have outsourced it, but I just wasn't sure if it was going to be the best long-term play for me and my team. Um, I still think about it all the time, like, because I, I just really liked the idea of it. Um, and I don't know, maybe as a millennial, I, it just kind of is attractive to me, the idea of, you know, having influencers kind of like uh, talk about my brand. But I realized that um, it does take a lot of work to just find these influencers you know, uh, contact them, get them to actually shoot the video, you know, put the codes up uh, and then repeat that process. Right. But it is a repeatable process. I haven't found it to be the best use of my time right now. I, I find like, I think for me, just launching like tons and tons of products is the best and influencer marketing works better when you have like a portfolio of products. Right. So mm -hmm. for me, like I have like products that are scattered all over the place so it's not just one big brand i have for all like 55 SKUs i have i just have like various different ones so like i'll have stuff in like in toys and uh toys home and kitchen beauty you know um all of that and it, i can't have one influencer do all of that so it's just um not the best strategy for me right now and that's um uh, why i don't do influencer marketing as much um but you know, if you, you're in a situation where like you have a brand um, or you have a couple products within the same product line, um, you can definitely do it. It's totally repeatable um, and scalable. So for me, like just quick overview of how I did this process is um, I would basically uh, make a list of, you know, influencers via YouTube. So check their subscriber count, check their comment count um, in my niche, right? So say if it was camping, and I saw a camping bag. So I would look up like, I would use the keywords like camping, uh, uh, backpacking, um, you know, uh, backpack reviews or something, right? And find all the big influencers in that list. So I'll make a list of like 20. And then I'll just like mass, um, uh, well, ideally you want to have a personalized uh, email to all of them or whatever. But I, I usually just like send a mass email and the ones that bite, I'll just go ahead and work with in order to save time. And then that's when I like, I try to arrange the schedule of like, Hey, I want to make a YouTube video uh, with you, give this product for free for you, give a, do a giveaway for your entire audience. But I want you to put a link under every single one of your YouTube videos to my Amazon product. And that's basically all you have to do. Uh, sounds really simple, but um, the whole tie it up in this whole process, like I said, it's just communicating with the influencer and making sure it gets done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like like you said, it sounds simple, that's it, but it's quite tiring and also can turn out to be a little expensive. Um, so are there any mar other marketing strategies that you frequently use? Um, you know, like something I've been toying with a lot more is uh, Facebook um, ads, uh, especially many chat. So we found that new by running like a many chat ad were able to, you know, collect basically like email subscribers. Um, so many chat, if you guys don't know, is like a Facebook messenger um, bot. Um, so if you're on Facebook messenger, you can have a, 
page to like contact you and send you like emails. And that's kind of what we've been doing. And so when we run a launch, we'll just run a, you know, like 50%, 25% launch on using Facebook ads, but it connects to basically your Amazon um, sales page. Um, and it connects to your Amazon sales page um, and it connects to your Facebook messenger bot. So you kind of build up um, both of those audiences and it can be sometimes cheaper to run than using a service like Power Launch, uh, Zonjump and whatnot. And at the end of the day, you actually collect your customer's data because, because um, with the Facebook Messenger bot, you can like send them like special offers to like things in the future too. So, so yeah. Interesting, interesting. And uh, that brings up the recent fiasco with uh, Amazon taking down a lot of reviews, right? So did you face any negative consequence of using bots for reviews, collecting reviews? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I personally have never gone in trouble with any review stuff. Um, so I consider myself lucky. Uh, hopefully it stays that way. Um, <clears throat> I do have a couple colleagues that have seen like their reviews get hit and whatnot. Um, I, ha I haven't seen a huge consensus, uh, like a huge um, uh, similarity between like the people who got in their reviews. Uh, band versus like people who haven't so I'm not really sure mm -hmm. what the correlation it is uh, for Amazon between um, all of that so yeah right right got it okay uh, that's that's good to know that you didn't get affected which is good so uh, speaking of social media channels customer engagement is becoming increasingly essential to drive good exposure to a brand right um, again sorry to coming back uh, to brand uh, anyway just talking about customer experience Campaigns on social media platforms is one of the ways to reach a diverse audience. In your experience, what are the ways that you can use social media marketing to run promotions effectively? Um, I mean, kind of like what I just said. Yeah. Uh, basically, with the, the messenger uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, apart from that, uh, do you think there are any other ways to maybe promote your products using social media? Um, I mean, you can do influencer marketing. Um, those are like the main two. Um, I just personally don't really focus on it because of like the 80 20 rule. I rather just focus on making sure everything works on Amazon because Amazon already provides you traffic. Um, so I just focus on winning on Amazon and then, um, if need be, maybe I focus on doing some Facebook ads. Um, but other than that, you know, like I know I can just win on Amazon, so I really don't really bother too much to learn uh, some of these other factors. Got it. So your main focus is on PPC campaigns in that case, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so PPC, launching correctly, making sure your listing is optimized for other keywords that you really, really need. Yeah. Got it, got it. And what, what is the best way to launch a product according to you since you've launched so many products? Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's kind of like complicated the route we go down, but uh, the overview, an overview of like what we've been like teaching our students and what they like seeing success with too, along with like our own data set is, uh, you know, there's PBC, we have like the auto broad, um, exact and phrase campaign set up. Uh, we haven't actually been launching, um, uh, anymore, like doing giveaways. Uh, we do do giveaways on some products if it is competitive. So we kind of like tiered it out into like low, medium, high. Mm -hmm. um, in the low sections, we just use PPC and medium, high, we do some giveaways. But essentially with this process, it all dials down into product selection, okay? So mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter if you have, you know, the greatest listing, the greatest images, you know, the greatest email follow-up sequences, the right keywords. If your product sucks, it sucks. Uh, yeah. So now uh, we really focus on like the first domino, right? Which is selecting a good product that's less competitive. Um, we're not shooting for products that do like 50,000 in sales a month usually anymore. Um, and we're shooting for those like lower products that do like 15, 10,000. Uh, $5,000 in sales a month because uh, those are just easier to launch um, and usually you don't have to do giveaways for some of these products um, which like saves money out of your pocket um, and then the margins are just higher too um, initially but um, that's why it's important to keep launching though because eventually you're going to face margin compression 
um, which is, you know, just all the other sellers coming into your market. Uh, and yeah, basically that's that. Great, great, awesome. So lastly, your Seller Trade Craft group on Facebook is doing pretty well and there's a lot of engagement from different levels of sellers, right? What does mm -hmm. the roadmap uh, for your group look like? Yeah, uh, yeah, interesting question. So for us, it's still about, so Seller Trade Craft, if you guys don't know, is like the Facebook group. Now I started a, maybe a year ago or two, uh, just because I wanted to attract more like-minded people like myself and I wanted to build a community for that. Um, so now it's grown to over 30,000 people. And um, what I'm trying to do with it now is to just really continue sharing and fostering that community of where people kind of just like document and share different tips about their journey. Uh, like such as what softwares they use, such as like Solar Prime or, um, you know, what services they use. And it's just like a really good feeding ground for like, hey, like I need a recommendation for a freight forwarder. I need a recommendation for a graphic designer. And people will come in um, and comment um, and share their resources like where possible. Um, for me down the line, in addition to like the education course that we have uh, right now, um, we're like looking to just really expand um, I guess our reach, right? Um, so we're really focusing more on like making more YouTube stuff to build out the content um, down that line. Cause we actually, f I found that most people um, have found us through uh, the education on YouTube. Um, and kind of like our, uh, we were saying right before we hit the recording button on this is that um, Amazon recently like invited us out to uh, Amazon's headquarters to be part of basically their board of advisors, which is going to be like less than a dozen people um, to be basically on a board of advisors for Amazon sellers. So Amazon is going to be providing us a lot of like knowledge and like they want us to help educate Amazon sellers about like best practices and really allow sellers to like myself to provide feedback to Amazon in terms of like, Hey, these are things that Amazon sellers are ha hating about you guys. And, this is why like your reputation is bad. Um, so, you know, one, um, us just like building, like for me, just documenting my like journey and my brand um, has led to just a lot of doors opening. Um, and I continue to, you know, just share like free stuff on YouTube and within my Facebook group, because I found that by being involved within the community, kind of like answers just flow to me. Like if I say something wrong, someone will correct me, right? Which is great. Um, I don't mind being wrong. And I love when people correct me because then it just, I don't go down the wrong path on accident. Um, and, you know, like I said, I've been meeting people all over the world. Like I met you in Vietnam, right? Um, because of, you know, just me talking about my journey, sharing my journey um, to the planet, right? And I really encourage like other people to do it too. Because as you start doing it more, you start to realize that like, hey, like maybe uh, you can get some softwares for free, right? That's been really cool too. Like, you know, just having uh, people reach out to me and be like, hey, like, do you want to try our product out? You know, if you like it, just talk about it, blah, blah, blah. And then same thing with like the Fright Forwarders. I've had Fright Forwarders give me like discounts uh, just because uh, I've been able to, they just know who I am and they're like, oh, hey, work with me. Give me a shout out whenever you get the chance. And uh, just little things like that really add up over time. But yeah, my main thing is like, I think the people that I'm meeting at a higher level within this Amazon business will go on to do cool stuff in the future. And if this is the way we first get connected, you know, in, uh, through entrepreneurship, then I'm all for it. And I hope that continues to grow like that. Awesome, awesome. And I hope to uh, for a great future for all of the Amazon sellers as well. Uh, so again, thank you so much, Anthony, for joining us today. And all of you guys who are watching the video, please do uh, like, comment, and share this video. Like our page on Facebook and Instagram. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great content. Thank you and goodbye.